True love, does it really exist? We've all heard of soulmates. Is it possible that we have a lifetime lover and partner in our strange journey? Written and published over 400 years ago, John Donne's The Good Morrow is one of the absolute best love poems ever written. Today we're going to take a brief look at Donne's biography, define a couple of terms associated with him as a writer, use his most well-known poem, The Flea, to define and understand the term metaphysical poetry, and finally analyze why his poem The Good Morrow does such a sublime job of expressing that one feeling that all of us long for, being completely, hopelessly, and truly in love. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and clicking on the bell icon for notifications. This is the channel to learn about literature and life. So what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is uh, look through very briefly John Donne's biography um, first and uh, just spend a few minutes on that. And then um, he's associated with a school of poetry called the Metaphysical School of Poetry. And we're going to read one of his poems, his most highly anthologized poems, which is not necessarily my favorite, by the way. It's called The Flea. And we'll go through it kind of quickly um, just in order to understand what this term metaphysical poetry means. And then after that, we'll look at um, one of his poems, which is just absolutely gorgeous, um, The Good Morrow. So uh, just really briefly, a little bit about his biography. So he was born in uh, 1572, as it says, to two devoutly Catholic parents. Why is that important? Because this is at the time um, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth when uh, Catholics were, um, well, when the, the Church of English, England, which had been established by her father, King Henry VIII, uh, back in the 1530s. And um, it was a very volatile time uh, for religion, both in Europe in general and in England specifically. Uh, Queen Elizabeth had... Um, uh, pursued a sort of middle way with Protestantism. And so the Church of England was the official Church of England. And um, so um, Catholics could be um, imprisoned. Um, they could be jailed um, if they were thought that they had, you know, brought in a Catholic priest from uh, Europe, which was illegal. They could be tortured, executed. So his the fact that he was Catholic um, during this time of persecution of Catholics in England is really important. Um, he probably quietly converted to Anglicanism or the uh, Church of England sometime in the 1590s, and we'll see that he um, was clear when he would later become an actual minister in the Church of England. So. Um, Great. He um, he studied at Oxford University, and actually because he was Catholic, he was not allowed to uh, receive a degree from Oxford. Um, in the 1590s, he also uh, traveled abroad. He fought with his fellow Englishmen um, against Catholic Spain in 1596. Um so he's um, he's on the continent. He's traveling. He's also studying law in London, and um, which uh, actually was probably a really fun thing to do, studying law in London in the 1590s, because um, they were at the um, the inns at court, and um, it was basically a you know like a lot of young men who had the money and the family connections to to study law. It wasn't like a formalized process the way law school is today. And they, <laughs> sounds funny, but they spent a lot of their time like writing poetry and putting on little plays and things like that. So it was really um, a time of studying literature as well for him. So um, um, in the late 1590s, he um, began a like a political, uh, diplomatic sort of career and um, um, became an assistant to an important person um, in London. Uh, and but that sort of uh, be well, that um, turned out to not be a good thing because um, I don't know if it wasn't a good thing, but it, he got his employer's 17 year old niece pregnant. Apparently they fell in love and um, but uh, she was of a very upper class noble family. And so the um, the they, but they fell in love. Um, 
Uh, she became pregnant. They got married in 1601, but it was a terrible thing for um for the two of them, because of his career, he was fired. He was actually briefly imprisoned. Um, he then he did get out of prison, but their financial situation was precarious and difficult for uh, the next decade. Um, so we're now into the 1600s. Um, so he was a pressure. He and his wife had um, around a dozen children. Um, in 1615, he had. He was kind of pressured by um, the the monarch who succeeded uh, Queen Elizabeth was King James the first, and King James the first knew of him. He had actually John Donne had um, written a fairly important and influential uh, defense of King James's oath of allegiance that uh, that forced. Uh, former Catholics to take an oath of allegiance to the Church of England, the Protestant Church of England. And so for Dunn to have written this thing um, in support of the oath of allegiance was kind of like a public, um, you know, dismissal of his former, um, of his being a Catholic formerly. So um, he was kind of pressured by the king to actually become a, a minister. And uh, he did. Um, in 1615 um, in 1617 his wife then um, died in childbirth and um, in 1621 he he becomes the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London uh, a position which he held for 10 years until his death in 1631 now it's kind of interesting because um, you know in an previous slide you know I described how in the 1590s he was he was living this kind of adventurous life basically he was kind of a player um, he was you know running around he was in uh, he fought with the English um, against Catholic Spain when he lived in London and he was studying law he was running around writing poetry um, and it sounds like from what we know of his life and also of his poetry that he was you know um, uh, just as I said, you know, he um, was really interested and in probably it sounds like really good at romance and seduction. And you can see that in a lot of his poems. So um, good. So now what we're going to do is um, uh, I just want to go over a couple of terms. And really my intention here with this is not to get weighed down by the terms, but actually just so that you can um, learn them as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And especially actually with metaphysical poetry, the terms are not that difficult. And when you look at a definition for metaphysical poetry online, there are all kinds of wildly confusing definitions. And I'm going to help you to understand by reading a John Donne poem exactly what metaphysical poetry is. And it's not at all hard to define it once we understand that. So but beforehand, we need to understand this uh, term, conceit, an elaborately sustained metaphor with complex logic covering an entire poem. So um, now people nowadays don't think of themselves as metaphysical poets. It refers to John Donne and a couple of people that wrote in a similar way to him. But uh, the word conceit is still used by poets and in creative writing classes to describe, um, you know, a sort of overarching metaphor of the poem. So that's what a conceit is. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the most one of the most well-known John Donne poems. It's called The Flea. And um, as we go through that, I'm going to go through that fairly quickly because I don't think it's the I'm, I'm positive it's not one of his best poems. It is, however, the most highly anthologized poem and the poem that you would come across. Um, and so just to be able to understand it um, and go through it is going to give us a perfect understanding then of what metaphysical poetry is. So um, let's look then at The Flea. And uh, we've got three stanzas here. And uh, it's really a fairly easy poem to understand and then once we've read it then we'll think okay so what is the conceit here what is the you know extended abstract metaphor that this poem is about basically what's the significance of the poem what is he saying and um and once we do that then we can understand what exactly is metaphysical poetry so 
Uh, Mark but this flea and mark in this how little that which thou deniest me is. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead, yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two, and this, alas, is more than we would do. Okay, so stanza one <clears throat> is just setting up this uh, the scenario for the poem, which is pretty simple. Um, he's courting a lady. He's trying to seduce her. Um, he's trying to get her to have sex with him. And now this is, and so he uses this idea of this flea that's bitten the two of them and supposedly has both of their bloods mingled inside the little tiny flea. Now this may seem original or weird. Uh, it's definitely weird, but it's not at all original. Surprisingly, this was a type of poem that was written about by dozens and dozens of other poets in the Elizabethan era. And it sounds kind of gross to us and kind of stupid, but for whatever reason in Renaissance England, it was all the rage to write um, a poem about seduction and uh, and use this idea of a flea biting the woman uh, that you were trying to seduce. And usually they were... Now, Dunn takes his very differently because it's going to be this very intellectual, sort of uh, amusing, witty poem for him but usually the other flea genre poems were more about the flea um the fact that it could land on you know a beautiful woman's arm or neck or whatever and so the male poet was jealous of the flea for that reason so anyway again it's not an original idea at all um okay good so we understand what happens there now um what now, Dunn is a flawless writer most of the time, and in this poem, he is a flawless writer. I said that I don't really love the poem that much, um, because to me, there's not very much emotional payoff. It's just witty, and it's witty only. And I think that in literature in general, when you find things that are only witty or only satirical, they are not going to be universal, universally important. They're not going to really deal in a substantial way with what it means to be a person and that's what literature is it doesn't matter if it's you know a great writer a russian writer like tolstoy or you know somebody more modern tony morrison or something like that but really great works of literature are not just going to be witty or sarcastic so anyway um but no big deal we understand stanza one stanza two oh stay three lives and one fleet spare where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge, and you, we are met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. So again, just understanding, uh, probably in between stanza one and stanza two, you can see that what Dunn does is there is a little sort of action in this little imagined scenario and so at the end of stanza one it appears that the woman was going to she was going to squish the flea you know kill it and so that's why he leads off the first line of stanza one with oh stay um but even now even though this isn't you know the most um even though the subject matter here isn't like really deep or really important you can still see that dunn is this technically really brilliant writer and so he'll do little things like um um Though parents grudge and you, we are met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. And that's really the, um, the, the mark of a great poet is that they'll use these word choices, which then have these, you know, um, layers of meaning and connotation around them that are slightly ambiguous, but that are just really powerful. So like cloistered in these living walls of jet. So he's just saying that, um, that their blood is inside is secured inside the flea but when he uses he chooses to use a word like cloistered then it has this connotation of like um well you know uh you know a monastery or a nunnery or something like that and so it's got these slightly religious implications um but it just um it just gives your imagination the ability to go off in ways um more so than if he had just said there you know, our blood is in this flea. He says they're cloistered in these living walls of shut. Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be and sacrilege three sins in killing three. Now you'll 
be able to see that probably, not probably, that in between stanzas two and three in the sort of action of the poem, the woman has now killed the flea. And so <clears throat> he starts off stanza three then. He says, cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail and blood of innocence. So it's really simple. She killed the flea. You know, she just killed it with her fingernail. <laughs> Wherein could this flea guilty be except in that drop which it sucked from me? Now, so here it's going to almost feel like this sort of goofy um, legal argument that he's making. He says in the third stanza, like, what was the, what did the flea ever do <laughs> except it took the tiniest drop of blood from you? Um, Wherein could this flea guilty be except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphest and sayest that thou findest not thyself nor me the weaker now. So then supposedly in this little hypothetical scenario, the woman has then said, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, the drop of blood that it took from me doesn't make me any weaker, etc. And so then his whole poem kind of culminates in these last three lines, which again, this poem, overall the flea, one of the most highly anthologized poems if not the most highly anthologized poems of his but i don't think it's the best poem by far and i'm not particularly fond of it but once we finish it then we'll look at what a metaphysical poem is <clears throat> and this poem the flea will have done a perfect job of helping us to understand that so tis true then learn how false fears be just so much honor when thou yields to me will waste as this flea's death took from thee so those last couple of lines, which are a little challenging, and you have to really kind of stay with them and unpack them, be like, what did he just say? Learn how false fears be. Just so much honor when thou yields to me will waste as this flea's death took from thee. So those last two lines, what is he saying? Just so much honor when thou yields to me, when thou yields. So he's talking when she yields to him. He's saying, when you yield to me, when you have sex with me, um, just as much honor you will lose when you have sex with me as the flea took from you by the one drop of blood. So in other words, he's making this highly elaborate, almost silly, um, but witty metaphor that, um, again, he's trying to convince this woman to have sex with him. And so the idea is, <clears throat> uh, at the very end that if she does have sex with him, she won't lose any of her honor. The amount of honor that she will lose will be as minuscule as the amount of life or health she would lose with one drop of blood. So that's the overall significance of the poem. So um, so we'll see that I've um, got that right here. The loss of her virginity. So again, there's the definition of what a conceit is. It's an elaborately sustained metaphor covering an entire poem. That's what any conceit is. And then in the poem, The Flea, the conceit is specifically um, written right there. The loss of her virginity has as little consequence to her honor as the loss of a drop of her blood does to her physical health. So, <clears throat> great. So now we understand exactly what a conceit is and what the conceit is in the poem, The Flea. And that'll help us to understand um, I've got now the definition for metaphysical poetry, and then we'll talk just a little bit about how the term came up. So the very most important thing to understand is that John Donne never, ever in his life sat around and said, oh, I'm going to be a metaphysical poet. Now, occasionally, actually frequently, um, in the 400 years since, uh, you know, uh, metaphysical poetry, in English literature and American literature, we've had dozens and dozens of different schools and movements, um, whether they're things like British Romanticism or um, in the 19th, in the early mid 19th century. So British Romanticism is in the late 1700s in England and um, late 1700s, early 1800s. And then that influences and kind of comes across the Atlantic and influences and maybe even becomes in some way transcendentalism and then you know literally there are a dozen different schools and movements in literature since then and occasionally <clears throat> people will um will write out almost like manifestos of their you know their school or their movement or sometimes it won't be um, a manifesto but it'll be something like in the beat generation where 
poets and writers will, you know, have a specific ideological framework that they're really trying to go. And so they really will believe and understand that they are writing within a certain school. But this does not apply to the metaphysical school of poetry. John Donne never said, oh, I'm going to be a metaphysical poet. I'm going to, you know, and here's what it means. No. So as it says in that first bullet point, um, this this term, so the definition for metaphysical poetry, again, there are all kinds of confusing definitions out there on the internet, and this is the best one, and it's short and it's concise, a philosophical poem, often witty, with far-fetched conceits that are mostly conceptual. So you can see how that fits perfectly into the metaphysical poem that we just read, The Flea. And then just to further help you understand that, again, the term metaphysical poetry was never brought up by the people who are now termed metaphysical poets. So they're listed at the bottom of the screen there. John Donne, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan, Andrew Marvell, and a few others. <clears throat> but none of them ever said, hey, I'm a metaphysical poet. So um, in the 1690s, there was an English writer, John Dryden, and he was actually the first poet laureate. Um, of England. And he, I will read you a little short quote um, of how he first used it. He just used the term metaphysics. And he was using it sort of in a disparaging term about John Donne. And this is what Dryden said about John Donne. This is in 1693. <clears throat> Donne affects the metaphysics, not only in his satires, but in his amorous verses, where nature only should reign and perplexes the minds of the fair sex with nice speculations of philosophy when he should engage their hearts and entertain them with the softness of love. So here Dryden um, is just saying, and this is where the word, you know, or the first origin of the use of the phrase metaphysical poetry, and then it's going to be, um, it's really going to um, get cemented by Samuel Johnson in the next century. But all Dryden said there was that um, he basically said that Dryden was saying that he didn't like Dunn's verse that much because it um, was more mental than it was, um, than it affected the feelings. And he was actually saying it specifically about love poetry, about Dunn's love poetry. So, um, <clears throat> so there we go. It's just, that was the word that he used. And then nearly a century later, Samuel Johnson. Now, Samuel Johnson is easily the most important English critic um, in the 1700s, he uh, basically, I kid you not, almost basically invented the English dictionary. He was brilliant. He was also a, like a sweet, wonderful man. He was just, um, just, uh, I can't say enough good things about, uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson, um, that he wrote a uh, criticism as well. And um, so he's going to say something uh, which kind of echoes what Dryden says. And I'll read you this. And it's kind of witty and funny. And, you know, the nice thing is if uh, Samuel Johnson puts you down, it's still a compliment because Dr. Johnson is such an important figure. And um, it would be far worse to be ignored by him than it would have been to have uh, had him say something. So this is what uh, Johnson wrote about Dunn. The metaphysical poets were men of learning, and to show their learning was their whole and to show their learning was their whole endeavor. But unluckily resolving it unluckily resolving to show it in rhyme instead of writing poetry, they only wrote verses. And very often such verses as stood the trial of the finger better than of the ear, for the modulation was so imperfect that they were only found to be verses by counting the syllables. So what Johnson is doing is he's picking up on the word metaphysics, which Dryden had used, and then sort of in a witty way saying that Dunn and other people that he associates with metaphysical poetry, um, that again, uh, for Johnson, he thought that they were trying to be too witty, and he didn't like um, their, <laughs> he thought that it uh, wasn't really good poetry. And so um, the only way that you could tell it was a poem, he said, was by counting the syllables because the modulation was imperfect. So um, so then um, the term by that point, you know, in 1779, that's um, almost 200 years after John Donne had started writing. And so then the term really stuck after uh, Johnson used it in the late 1700s. And then, um, you know, people since then, other 
critics and professors and writers have argued about whether or not was metaphysical poetry good or bad. Now, as you can see, Dryden and Johnson were both, um, you know, making slightly disparaging comments about it. <clears throat> but then we get up into the 1900s, and one of, well, the most influential um, writer and critic in the early to mid 1900s, um, the writer T.S. Eliot, who you sometimes read in both American literature courses and in English literature, because uh, T.S. Eliot was born in St. Louis, he's an American, went to college at Harvard, but then later he moved to London and then lived most of his adult life in London and became, um, you know, uh, an English citizen. So um, he and so he carries a lot of weight, and Eliot uh, really liked uh, John Donne and um, liked metaphysical poetry in general. So the you know consensus kind of turned a little bit there. So, all right, great. So now we understand what metaphysical poetry is, and you understand it just from having seen the flea, and then having understood that it's you know it's a it's a it's sort of a mental poem, and it's often witty, and it's got this far fetched conceit like the flea, and that's all you need to know. And um, really, by the way, um, what's wonderful, once you kind of get this down, I would say that metaphysical poetry, and Dunn is the principal person that people are um, thinking about when they, um, you know, mention or talk about metaphysical poetry. <clears throat> but um, it's really the first important um, school of, uh, or literary movement. Um, so it's really nice to understand that. Okay, so the next poem that we're going to look at, which is a beautiful poem, and uh, like I said, it's literally one of the most beautiful love poems ever written. And it's not witty, it's sincere, and just gorgeous. And so we'll be looking at it in just a second. Um, it's called The Good Morrow. And The Good Morrow is an obod which is uh, just a word meaning that it's a song or a poem greeting the dawn or lovers departing at dawn. And so it just um, refers to, so there are um, sometimes uh, pieces of classical music, which are called obods. And it's just the feeling that you're supposed to get from an obod is um, that it is um, usually like lovers who have woken up together, who are waking up together in the morning. And so that's what an obod is. So uh, before we look at the good morrow, we'll take a look at John Donne himself and see. <clears throat> well, if <laughs> I think this is courtesy of the National uh, Portrait Gallery in London, and um, and who better who better to write one of the best love poems ever than um, this melancholic fellow? So um, great, and there's really much better payoff. Um, for having read and understand the good moral, because it really is, um, it concerns one of the most, if not the most important, you know, things that we do or that we aspire to, which is falling truly in love. So, and again, what you can see here is, um, you can see Dunn's <clears throat> intelligence and, you know, but how wonderful he is as a writer in The Good Morrow, but it's not supposed to be that sort of witty, funny thing that The Flea is. This is an actual poem about falling deeply and truly in love. So let's dive into this. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Now you can see what's going to happen in the first uh, stanza. There are just three stanzas to The Good Morrow. And in the first stanza, he's just asking this question, what, the, again, the love that he's experiencing what, having woken up with her in the morning is so powerful that the way he starts the poem is he's really saying like, what was life even like before I met you? So this is why this is such a great poem because it's really sincere. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? Or snorted we in the seven sleepers den? So he just asks these quick couple of questions like, God, what was life even like? before we met each other, before we fell in love. Um, uh, and then we're snorted we in the seven sleepers den. That can be a little confusing. Um, it just refers to a myth of seven Christian youths who I think in the late Roman Empire or something like that were during a time of persecution of Christians, they hid and supposedly hid for several hundred years. They fell asleep. And so <clears throat> it's a little confusing, but it's just supposed to be, you know, that 
he's questioning like what was life even like before we met each other if ever any beauty i did see which i desired and got twas but a dream of thee now look at those last two lines in stanza one they're so beautiful if ever any beauty i did see which i desired and got twas but a dream of thee so what he's saying is just really simply if if i was in love before if there was anything beautiful in my life um another lover or just anything at all which i had desired and got it was but a, like a mirage or like a delusion or a dream of thee i also think that you you can take it a little bit further and perhaps you've had the experience of if you have fallen truly in love then you look back on people that you've dated beforehand and maybe there is like one characteristic in them that you liked in the characteristics of these former lovers um, are then they end up being so like really accentuated in the person that you're head over heels in love with so that's a way to think about it too um, that everything before everything beforehand was just but a dream and also maybe there were almost like hints or reflections of this wonderful person in the past sort of scattered through your life <clears throat> Great. So second stanza. And now, good morrow to our waking souls. Now, remember, so the title of the poem is Good Morrow. And why does he say now, good morrow to our waking souls? Because again, they're literally, the poem is about them waking up in bed together. They've made love the night before. They've slept together in the same bed and they're waking up and they're both perfectly in love. And he says, and now, good morrow to our waking souls which watch not one another out of fear for love all love of other sights controls so that first line good morrow to our waking souls is so powerful because um their bodies are literally waking up because it's morning but he's saying that their love is so earth shattering and so real and so such a change for them that literally their souls are just now waking up it's like a rebirth for them and then um the fourth line is so perfect and makes one little room in everywhere and that's just the feeling that if you've been in love and you wake up in the morning with this person and everything's perfect you know there's no it literally just it wipes away any kind of cares or concerns that you have and it makes the room that you wake up in the bed and the room is the whole world for you because nothing else matters because you're so completely happy makes one little room and everywhere let's see discoverers to new worlds have gone let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown let us possess one world each hath one and is one so that last line of stanza two is so beautiful because the way i take it is that um let us possess one world so he's you know saying that um together the two of them will be one world together that nothing else matters but their love for each other but then he says each hath one and is one and that's probably true about true love is that you have to be your own person before you fall in love and if you're not then the relationship is not going to fare well you have and that's just something that you know you can get it from pop psychology you can also just get it from life if you are too young or too inexperienced in any way when you fall in love it's not going to last because you have to be your whole complete person so that's what that last line means let us possess one world each hath one and is one so the two people who are fully developed themselves when they fall in love then they are also this new one world together so all right so the third stanza i was suggesting that they're waking up together now you can see that that's exactly what he says that they're doing my face in thine eye thine in mine appears and so pause for just a second there and you have to kind of unpack that um my face in thine eye thine and mine appears so how does that happen well if that's a little confusing or a little um abstract it it's actually shouldn't be what he's suggesting is probably their heads their faces are so close to each other that they can see the reflection of each that he can see his own reflection in her eye my face in thine eye 
thine and my appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. So he can see that, um, you know, the, the phrase, the, um, the eyes are the window to the soul. And as he looks in her eyes and she looks in his, they feel this um, sense that they're not only is it true love, but also that, um, that their hearts are open and true. So, and then he says, where can we find two? So the hemispheres here, he's kind of making a, a play because um, a little verbal play and pun because he's John Dunn and that's what he does. Um, but the two hemispheres are both their faces. So like their faces are hemispheres, but then he's also playing on that as, um, you know, uh, the hemispheres of the world. So where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? And what he's suggesting there without sharp north and declining west. So probably just in the hemispheres of, you know, the globe, sharp north just refers to the fact that it's cold in the north and unpleasant. In declining west, well, the sun sets in the west. So de- so what he's done there in that one line is saying that um, the two of them together, their relationship doesn't have coldness or unpleasantness. And then, you know, ending it, whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one or thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. So that that third line up from the bottom, whatever dies was not mixed equally. So that's really beautiful. And then um, there are actually different variations of the poem. And we don't know which how he spelled dies originally, if it was dies like that with an I or if it was with a Y meaning, you know, color or some type of ink. Um, but you can kind of read it any either way that whatever dies was not mixed equally. So whatever is, you know, permanent and lasting, if it doesn't stay, then it wasn't mixed equally. And for him, um, what that means in that last line, which is so lovely, um, if our two loves be one or thou and I love so alike that none do slack. And so I like that idea there in the very last line that none do slacken. So it seems to be maybe um, referencing the fact that in a relationship, yes, there's this true love that he's describing, but also there's going to like you actually have to kind of recognize and even like put some effort into the um, put some effort basically into the the relationship so that it doesn't slacken. And then if you do, then it's you know, neither one of us will die. It'll last forever. So, so really, really beautiful poem, The Good Morrow. Now, so we're finishing up right now. And what I would suggest, so you understand um, exactly, you know, what metaphysical poetry is. Um, and uh, you don't, you don't need any fancier definitions than that. <clears throat> because really, again, it wasn't something that either Dunn or those other people who are associated with it. Um, it wasn't something that they, you know, like conjured up together. It was a label that was applied that was applied to them, you know, 100, 200 years after they wrote. Um, Marvell, Andrew Marvell is a wonderful poet. And um, uh, one of his most famous poems, which you've probably heard of before, if you haven't read, is To His Coy Mistress. It's a Carpe Diem poem about uh, seducing a woman and uh, trying to convince her to sleep with him as well. And um, that's a really beautiful poem. And uh, what I'm going to say before we finish things, first of all, is um, I got some of the ideas. um, If there was a book that I would recommend for um, helping to understand John Donne, helping to understand his poetry, it's this book. um, It's just called John Donne, The Poems by Joe Nutt. He's a... a British uh, teacher, and um, it's a just a wonderful book. It's got just literally, as I say, their um, flawless analysis of Dunn's verse, and then a, just a little brief biography of Dunn, and it's just it's a really great book if you want to look more closely into Dunn. And then also what I'd suggest with um, this, uh, us having looked at that, is Try, um, once you've done that, once you've performed a close reading on a poem, which, you know, we just did, then think about um, not immediately, um, not immediately just watching the next YouTube video or something like that, but um, you're, you basically focus your attention on a close reading, which we just did twice, 
you really focus your attention so you get this sort of zen feeling of um of mental clarity and what i might suggest to you is you know pause stop your watching of youtube right now and then take that sort of heightened clarity that you feel almost like a not to get too mystical or anything but it's almost like a heightened state of consciousness or just more clearly focused attention and take this in and put this into like the next thing that you do so instead of keeping what you know watching videos take this into if you've ever done some journaling uh do a little journaling right now write about you know the poem or about anything else or about true love so take this and do that or if you've uh your if you practice meditation it'd be perfect to go into meditation right now or even just something simple like going for a walk or exercising or anything at all but try to take this sort of heightened consciousness that you have in this this improved state and then do something that's a little bit more um it's going to be a little bit more productive because your attention is focused and clear right now and so that will uh really you can just take that and move it into something that's either more productive or that's also like a sort of mental exercise so um i hope that was wonderful and we will um more videos to come thank you